Welcome everyone to the webcast. We're going to be starting in just a minute or two. We're going to allow anyone who is a little late to join the webcast. So sit tight. We'll get started in just a minute or so. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, How UBA UAM Reduces Insider Data Leakage, sponsored by Variato. I'm your host, Nick Cavalancy from Tech Evangelism. Before we get started today, let's cover a few housekeeping details. Uh, first off, today's webinar is being recorded, so expect an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recording. Uh, today's slides, as well as a number of other resources, are available in the handout section of your GoToMeeting control panel. Feel free to download those now or at any time during today's presentation. And lastly, we do encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. We'll cover those questions at the end of today's presentation. So use the questions section of the control panel and submit any questions you have at any point in time throughout the webinar. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, today we've got two really great speakers. A bit later you're going to hear from Jack Doyle. He's a senior sales engineer from Variato. But first up today is Derek Smith. Now Derek Smith has over 30 years in the security industry. He's a former government agent, a cybersecurity subject matter expert. He holds a variety of certifications including CISSP, uh, CEH, Security Plus, and I have an Etc. on there on his bio. Um, he has eight college degrees. Yes, I said that correctly, eight college degrees. He's a published author, conference speaker, cybersecurity analyst for several international and local TV stations, uh, government program manager, and more, as if he doesn't do enough. And you can follow him on Twitter at Derek A. Smith, and then the number one at the end. So uh, with that, Derek, welcome to today's webcast, and take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, for that great introduction. And hello, everybody. It's good to be with you all again um, for another webinar. Today, I want to talk about, as he said, um, user and entity behavior analytics and how it applies to data leakage. And before I do that, um, Nick mentioned that I was a government federal agent for a while. So I spent almost 20 years as a federal agent with a variety of agencies. But one in particular stands out, and that was the Department of Education Inspector General. And it stands out because while I was there, I was their expert, I'll say, at insider threat. Okay, and you say insider threat with Department of Education, what is that all about? Well, basically, insider threat was one of our biggest risks. And the thing is that um, what we had was children would reach 18 years old and it was time for them to go to college, and they would find out that student aid had already been taken out in their name. And so now they had to prove that it wasn't them that took out this aid and that they can still go to college, they can still get federal funding. Why was it? Why were they afflicted by this? Well, first of all, people can use their names, their um, their information when they're very young, say one or two years old. And, and let me say this: a lot of them were family members. So a family member, a mom, a dad, whomever, ever, or older brother, would take the young children's information and they would use it to get aid. So that by the time the kid is 18 years old, they had nothing left. And no one found out about this, of course, for 18 years, because nobody's looking at this until it's time to go to college. Another area we had for insider threat and for uh, identity theft and things like that were elderly. 
people were using elderly because they weren't checking their credit to see if they got student loans or anything like that. So nobody discovered for quite some time when a person is 60, 65 years old or, you know, older person not using student aid. So basically, uh, although the Department of Education and, and we had a lot of fraud from other places, you know, companies that say they're teaching students and there were no students there and a variety of other things, most, I'll say 70, 80 percent of our problems came from insiders misusing, um, misusing people's identities. So I, I kind of wanted to use that as a segue into what we're talking about. Now, we're talking about data le leakage. It's a little bit different, but I want to kind of start with that and, you know, this whole insider threat thing. And I'm doing this because a lot of organizations spend a significant amount of their time, their resources, trying to stop hackers from getting company data right they don't spend a lot of time trying to stop things that are happening on the inside but as I'm going to show you in just a few minutes of course most of the threat most of our loss comes from the inside so let's get right into this again hello again that's me that I'm Derek Smith and before I start talking about which actor poses the greatest threat I want you to consider um, your home first and let me say I, two weeks ago well uh, first of all three weeks ago I live in a pretty good neighborhood, but our entire neighborhood was hit by thieves. And when I say hit, they hit every car in the neighborhood. Our cars parked in our um, in our driveways. Every single one of them were broken into. So to make my wife feel better, I spent two thousand dollars over the last two weeks upgrading our our, our um, security system. So now I have cameras on the outside of my house, surrounding my entire house. I have automatic door locks I can lock from my phone. If somebody rings my doorbell. They can see, I can see them on my telephone. And I can actually talk to them through the doorbell. You know, all these security enhancements to try to make her feel better, right? So I want to start with that. Um, um, and, and I'll talk about that in just one second. But I have a slide here that says, which actors poses the greatest threat? And this is where I'm going to start talking about um, these robbers, these people who want to break into our homes and all that. And it's going to relate to IT in just a few minutes, but I want to start with that. So... If you consider the different threat actors that we have out here against your home, to kind of um, give you an analogy, everybody knows that people can break in, that there's robbers out there. And we do like I do. You spend a lot of money, a couple grand on locks and security devices, and you get insurance that's going to cover you against theft and all that. And robbers are more likely than not going to be financially motivated. They want to get in. They want to steal our high-value objects. And they want to take those away and they want to sell them somewhere, a pawn them, or whatever they can do to get money. And usually, unfortunately, they're not going to get what we pay for those objects, but it doesn't matter to them because they're getting something. Now, that robber, of course, is going to be the outside threat to our home. But the likelihood of your home being hit by a robber in any yearly period, 12-month period, is only about 3%. So that's not going to be a likely thing. You know, uh, it happens. Let me say this. I hate to say that I'm from the south side of Chicago. It happens more often than not where I grew up. But it doesn't happen to me very often now. Now, another uh, potential outside, of course, as you see on my screen, I kind of went out of order, order, is the terrorists, the terrorist threat. You know, there's a lot of things happening now in society, a lot of terrorism and, and, and things like that. And in the military and in the government, I was a counterintelligence agent. So I deal probably a lot more with terrorists than you would now. But it can happen. You know, the terrorist hit squads are out there. We see more and more things on the news almost every single time we turn on the television now. However, the probability of being successfully targeted by terrorists is only about 1 in 20 million. So although, you know, the news sensationalizes it, it's not likely that um, we're going to be hit by terrorism. We probably have a better chance of winning some of the lotteries out there than getting hit by terrorism. However, it only takes one. And that one time can inflict, of course, catastrophic danger, I mean, catastrophic damage um, to us. But the main thing about it is that it's, it's going to be a small percentage. It's probably not going to happen. Okay? Another thing is that that's still also the outside threat. Next, we have the organized cybercrime. There's a lot of stuff in the news about tampering with, you know, with um, our election system and, and, and other in, uh, tampering from organized cyber criminals. Not just that lone hacker that's sitting by himself trying to break into um, your computer and steal some credit card information or something like that, but these people that have sophisticated techniques and means, the syndicates out there who could initiate and conclude an attack on your home or on your business and never step foot inside your home. All right? 
they can attack your home computer network. They can attack your Internet of Things um, devices. Here's the thing. I got these security cameras and everything, and one of the biggest things I asked was about hack, getting them hacked. Like, I have cameras. They can turn them against me. You heard about the smart TVs being hacked. And I did a television report on baby monitors being hacked, and we demonstrated you can talk to the baby through those. So my main thing was that. And they told me, well, we use 256K, um, I mean, bit encryption. And they told, tried to sell me on all the security stuff. Even though it's a penetration tester, I kind of worry about that. So we worry about this Internet of Things and our devices and people accessing our banking information and our credit information and our investment accounts and on. And let me tell you this. Even though I'm a cybersecurity professional, I get notices probably at least weekly, two or three notices, of somebody trying to get into some account of mine, PayPal or email or something. So we all can be hit by these things. And that person is going to try to clean out, the, the sophisticated criminal is going to try to clean out our account <coughs> or get our information before we even recognize that they're there. So these are some of the greatest risks that we have from that outsider. Okay, We have 33% and 3%. So that's 36%. Right. However, let me change slides here. Um, now I want to look at the insider. And as a analogy here, I have a nanny. So you know, I have twins. They're ten year old, ten years old now. But at one point, we had a nanny coming into the house to help my wife with them when they were a baby. So that nanny would pose a 64% likelihood of criminal activity based on research. And again, this is not what really happened with her, but this is something that you have to be aware of. Why is that? Because that nanny has insider access. She's going to learn where I keep my most valuable assets, you know, where my most sensitive assets are. She's going to know the value of those assets, the best time to initiate attack against me. You know, she knows my schedule when I'm in and out of the house. She gets free reign in the house, you know. So basically, she doesn't need to find a covert way to get past my home security system. All these cameras and everything I just put in would do nothing against her. She has the keys to the kingdom or the keys to my front door, and she has the code to my security system. So she's going to be a more expensive and a bigger threat to me than those outsiders, okay, based on the access that she has. As a matter of fact, another story, a friend of mine who's a, um, who's a special agent, he, didn't, he had a, a weapon at home, a firearm at home. He is an agent. And he didn't. He realized he didn't. He don't know how long it was missing. Just like a, a, a you know insider threat. He didn't know how long it was missing. But he discovered it when his weapons was missing. And then when he went back and reviewed, he found out that his cleaning person, who comes in once a month and he's been using her for years, had taken the gun out of the house. So again, that insider threat, and just like a, a threat on our network, it took him a while to discover that the weapon was even missing. Because that's not something he went back. It wasn't his daily use weapon. It's not. So he didn't even know it was gone. So these are some of the problems that we um, see as far as inside and outside threat. And this is, of course, attributing it to your home. Now, if that threat is caused by the nanny, again, that inside actor, the chances are it will not be realized, as I told you, as any malicious intent. Now, I want to go to research for a minute. Research indicates that most inside threats are actually the result of human error, not somebody maliciously going in and trying to take something like I demonstrated with this nanny or the nanny who stole my friend's gun. Most of the time, it's going to be uh, human error, and that's 87% of the cases. Another one is a lack of um, awareness of security issues. That's 82% of the questions, and I mean, I'm sorry, of the cases. And then an inadvertent introduction of malware through personal devices is also 82% of the cases. Just three weeks ago, and I'm a cyber guy, just three weeks ago at work, I received an email, and the email said, Derek, someone at work has given you an award. Someone appreciates your work, and they have given you an award. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, you know what? This is probably not true. And I'm, I'm molding over, and I'm like, I sh probably shouldn't open this. But what if somebody really did give me an award at work? What if somebody really did value what I've been doing here? And you know what I did? As a security expert, advising you and advising the world about security, I opened it. And what do you think happened? As soon as I opened it, I got a message saying, if this had been a real uh, phishing attempt, you would have been compromised. And I should have known better because two weeks before that, we had just given security awareness training, uh, yearly security awareness training. So even me, an expert at this, fell um, victim to a phishing attack. That's why we have to continuously educate folks on, you know, and, and continue to remind them. It can't be a once-a-year thing. You have to continue to remind the regular people, 
not us security experts, about the dangers that's out there. But nonetheless, even though every organization, every company passionately guards against the outside uh, cyber intruder, it's that inside actor that I'm talking about, that nanny, let's say, who is most worrisome actor when it comes to data leaks. You know, This is where the data is going to go out. I, I hate to always pick on Snowden, but Snowden was an insider attack. Those are the things you hear in the news. Just two weeks ago, I think it was, there's another woman who's now leaked other NSA information, I believe, another insider attack things that we have to worry about once again. All right. So again, that's that 62% of those cyber attacks are from those insiders. They already have credentials and access to all your assets, just like that nanny. You know, They know their way around the system already, just like her knowing their way around your house. And they can pass off nefarious activity as work-related. So it's hidden. We can't even, um, we won't even recognize that it's happened um, for, for a while. So that's one of the problems. So these credential imposters that I'm talking about are individuals who sought, um, for instance, um, just like the nanny, they sought and gained employment within a company for the purpose of infiltrating that company's security and accessing confidential or digital assets. You know, and then just like that nanny, I'm not I'm not trying to downgrade her job, but just like her, they're going to seek out low-level jobs so as to hide in plain sight. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be found. A good hacker, a real hacker, not a script kitty, not someone planning your system, wants to be in there for as long as possible so they can continue to get the goods as long as possible. So while they employ with you, they're going to seek to access as many digital assets as possible and then to covertly sneak those things out, swindle, manipulate, steal those things by any means that they can to acquire increasingly higher system access and credentials. This is what they're looking for. Now, you also have your, your bad guys, just the people who are disgruntled. So some insiders develop a bad attitude over time. You know, they have something against the company, um, something against the way you treat them at the company, whatever it may be, but they, they have this attitude. And they are going to, even though it's a, major, a minority of folks, they're going to pose a significant risk to your organization. Because they intend to use their authorization and their access to assets for criminal and malicious purposes. You know, even if it's not criminal, because most of them don't want to don't want to do a crime, perhaps, but they do want to hurt the company because they're upset with the company for whatever reason. Okay, again, most insider threats are not nefarious by intent, but that negligence on the part of your folks, that lack of attention to cybersecurity makes them, again, that weakest link in our security chain. Okay? So who are these individuals? If you look at my slide there on the left, the cyber, where the cyber threats come from, uh, only 38% of threats come from attackers outside your organization, once again. Okay? So the, you know, that's the typical hacker that we think about. But that remaining 62% I showed you, 2% of those are criminal imposters who actually try to get credentialed and get into your organization. 14% of those come from insides with criminal malicious intent, those people I said intend to harm you. And then 46%, and this is even more important to you all, you all listen, this is something that should definitely capture your attention. 46% come from negligent insiders, employees who uh, make legitimate mistakes. You know, and how do we capture those mistakes? How do we make, those, make sure those things are not happening? And that's some of the things we're going to talk about today and what we have to think about. Now, I want to give a few scenarios of some real-life things that have occurred um, that, that, that um, should kind of bring this home for you and show you what, um, how this happens and what, they are, what it is out there. But let me start with this. If you look at the right si side of my slide, it says the data leak definition. So data, links are actually, uh, data leaks are actually defined uh, more broadly, as it says, than a data breach. So a breach is what happens when data has potentially been viewed, stolen, or used by unauthorized persons. A leak, on the other hand, is the unauthorized transfer of data outside your organization's IT system. Okay? And again, that outsider, even though I say that a small percentage are outsiders, once they get your credentials and then they break into your system and they escalate their privileges, guess what they look like? They look like insiders. So we still have to approach this like we're looking for the inside threat, like we're looking for something that's going from the inside out. If you look at your firewalls, if you look at your, your, your switches and your routers and your, your rules that you have, mostly they're looking at what's coming into the organization. 
Nothing is looking at what's take, being taken out of your organization. And that's where we're going to have to change our thinking. So let's look at some of these things we have here. This one is a Snapchat. This is the first uh, case study, unwitting accomplice to data leakage. Okay. So again, this is that negligent person that didn't even know what they were doing. So Snapchat. It's a Snapchat payroll here. And this person, um, basically someone with a phishing email. I'll go through the slide first and I'll give you some background. But they say received a phishing email supposedly coming from the CEO, Evan Spiegel. They erroneously clicked the link on the phishing email, resulting in the release, uh, resulting in the release of uh, personal protected information of around 700 employees. So let's look at this. This person was tricked. This payroll employee who was involved with this was tricked into emailing sensitive data of those 700 um, current employees, and that included their names, their social security numbers, their wage data, and things like that. So Snapchat went out and, um, of course, they wanted to remedy this thing. So they worked with FBI on this, and they offered the folks who were, who were affected by this two years of um, identity theft protection, which is great, you know, to, to do something. What they plan on doing, though, is they wanted to increase its employee cybersecurity training efforts. They wanted to educate people on phishing emails and how to recognize the problems when they see it. And why is that? Because um, it, it's, it's the human element. How do you fix the human element? Okay. So in a survey, they said 30% of companies rated the human ele element as a serious concern. But listen to this. That's only 30%. That means that 70% of companies don't recognize the human element as a real concern or a serious concern. And that's a problem for me because, again, that's where our biggest threat lies. And also it says in the survey just 54% offer some sort of cybersecurity training. 54%. Almost half the companies don't even give cybersecurity um, awareness training. Okay, And when they do give it, guess when they do it? Most of it is part of your new employee orientation, or as I said, an annual refresher course. Let me tell you about the annual refresher courses I've seen out in the industry. Most of the time you get sent an email saying that you need to go in and do your annual refresher training, and you'll watch a video or some training, and you'll just kind of take your keyboard and you'll enter, keep entering until you get through this thing, take the simple test they give at the end, and you, continue, you finish your, your annual training. I've been training for 25 years. Let me tell you something about training and education. The purpose of training and education is to change behavior. If your training does not change behavior, you have not been successful. You have not changed that human element. You have not shown them the importance of um, good cybersecurity awareness training and then made them understand that so that they can want to be involved with that training. So. Another thing about Snapchat is that they did have some security problems in the past. A few years ago, there was a bug um, that left the usernames and phone numbers of all their users exposed. And a group went out and exploited it. And they released information about 4.6 million accounts in an effort to highlight the company's lax security practices. They wanted to show that they can get these accounts. You know, these cowboys, they just showed that they can break in. Not to steal anything, not to be malicious per, per se, but to show that they can do it. But this latest breach, again, only affected current and former employees, according to the um, information that I saw. So that's important. Let's look at another one. Employee negligence result in data, um, data leak. So now this one is with the city of Calgary. Um, so an employee, this happened in June 2016, an employee there mistakenly leaked the personal information of about 3,700 city employees. <clears throat> so let's look at the slide. So he's working with um, employee personal injury, cl injury claim data. And they sought technical assistance, of course, and they leaked, again, the personal injury claim information of about 3,700 employees. Now let's look at this incident. Here, the information transferred included information from 2012 all the way through 2016. And as I told you, it was their workers' compensation data. And it talked about employee injuries, it talked about the costs. It talked about, it also gave employee IDs and the business units they worked in and things like that. That's important information. Number one, your injuries should be kept private, of course, but your employee data and your business units could be used for further exploitation later on. They could use that for phishing, um, phishing experiments, you know, to try to get more information, to escalate their privilege and all that. Now, the information was le leaked in mid-June and it was disclosed around mid-August. And with the Calgary city officials, they declined to say how long it took to discover the leak. We don't know how long that leak was actually out there, how long it, it had, the folks had been in the system in the first place. 
Now, the incident was discovered when a third party actually passed a letter to the media. So, again, the city was trying to hide it. They did not want the people to know that this was occurring in the first place. The leak was um, unintentional. Again, it was an employee, um, and this employee cooperated with the investigation. He helped with the cleanup and things like that. But, again, it was negligence. And the city's response includes them going back and doing a review of their data policy to see how they can pr to try to prevent this from happening in the first place. Now I have one more for you. This one is malicious or criminal data leakage. So this time it's malicious. And we have a hit sniff programmer. And they stole the database of all the client information. And they started emailing clients under a new company name, which I'll talk about in just a second. And what did this result in? Basically, this company went out of business. It resulted in hit sniff for can canceling all recurring e-payments and no longer functioning or answering any emails. So this rogue insider was a founding staff member. It was a programmer with broad security access that started with the company. And as I said, they stole the database of the company clients, and they started emailing those clients under a new company name. And that new company name was called Hit Steps. So Hit Sniffer went out, and they released a, um, a statement on this website. Let me tell you what that statement said. It says, Hit Sniffer was compromised by a programmer who had worked for the company since, in, since its inception. This programmer has stolen all databases, the customer database is now in his hands. You will probably have received an email from a company called HitSteps. This company has no relationship with HitSniffer. HitSteps is now using our custom database to contact our customers. A little bit more. We have made allegations of theft and fraud regarding this matter, and it has now been investigated by the police. We have canceled all recurring PayPal payments to our company, as we certainly do not wish to receive any payments from our clients. We cannot provide service. We cannot apologize enough for your loss. Please be aware that a company called HitSteps have been emailing our customers using our customer database. But basically, this faux pas from this person actually um, ended up shutting this company down. Now, that programmer denied the charges of theft that he, even took, that he took it in the first place. But you see how easy um, this can happen. So the revelations from his sniffer should be a reminder to you all uh, of the insider threat that's faced by all organizations. I know I give this um, example all the time, but I'm going to give it once again. When I worked at Booz Allen Hamilton, we went through where we, where we, um, we got rid of 1,000 employees one time. We did it a couple of times, but we got rid of 1,000 employees. And when we did that, the lower-level employees like myself, you know, they can replace us easily. We were, given, we were, we were asked to leave immediately. I, I wasn't laid off, but the, they were asked to leave immediately. My, I had a supervisor who was a million-plus partner. He had 30 days to leave. So he had 30 days to be in the system doing whatever he wanted before he had to log off and leave the building. Now think about this. I'm a low-level guy. I can get another cybersecurity job in a, in a week or so tomorrow or whatever. But a million-dollar earner, how quickly is he going to be able to get another job? And what does he have access to? He could have got, just like this hit sniffer person, he could have gotten Booz Allen accounts, reached out to those people. I'm not saying he did this. Reached out to those people if he want to start his own. The significance of this thing, Booz Allen could have lost millions of dollars worth of um, clients um, had, had they done this. Cause I've been with companies who wanted to be not with me because I'm Booz Allen, but they wanted to be with me because of Derek and the, and the service Derek provides. It could have been the same for this individual. So this hit sniffer breach that I showed you demonstrates the fact that privileged users with seniority in your company cause or pose the biggest threat of malicious insider activity. And they're the ones most difficult to guard against with routers and switchers and firewalls and, and things like that. They won't catch this type of activity. Now, I'm going to talk about preventive maintenance later, but a basic step that all companies need to take when they use data, or when they have storing their data, is data classification. They want to ensure that all those files are automatically labeled with the ability to add the right security level on it. And then all those, com those confidential files need to be classified and potentially encrypted when you create them. And why do you want to encrypt it? Because that's going to make it more difficult for someone to use. First of all, it'll be more difficult for them to exfiltrate, them, exfiltrate, exfiltrate, I'm trying to say the word, that information in the first place. But also, if that information is compromised, the best thing about it is that if it's encrypted, that employee wouldn't have been able to read it. Okay, so I just want to bring that out now while I'm talking about this, this, um, this particular incident. Okay, those encrypted document permissions 
are going to be well. This is even better if you can make those those um, those encrypted document permissions temporary. So as soon as that user's rights are revoked, if I take this hit sniffer programmer off the system, as soon as those rights are revoked, no matter where that document is traveled or where it's being stored, that user would no longer be able to view that that content. So that's something to take a note of if you get nothing else from here, and make sure you use that later on. So let's keep going. So now, when we look at quantifying those data leaks, there's a one in three chance of being attacked by an outside threat agent. If you look at the right side, it says the outside threat agent is about 33%. Now, you're going to average 3.8 insider attacks per year. So you have a much larger chance of being hit by an inside attacker than you do an outside attacker. And another significant thing about that is that the average cost of that outsider data breach is $4 million. The average cost of an insider incident is $4.3 million. When you're like, well, Derek, that's pretty close. What's the difference there? Well, let me show you the difference. So the annualized cost, if you're only going to get hit, you know, 0.33% of the time, is a $1.3 million loss per year. However, the loss for that insider attack is... put your money. You should put your money for fixing things perhaps on looking at the insider incidents. Now let's look at how insider um, threats or insider data is leaked. Because this is all about data leakage. So what are some of the ways that, um, that we have for uh, leaking data in the first place? So um, what I have here is postal mail. You have your employees who open something, open up a mail, uh, some mail that they get, or they add something to an email. Email is the second one, and they send information out via email. So it tells me that one of the things that we probably want to be looking at, of course, is what's in um, email data, right? What's going out in email? Um, what what do they have access to? You know, how can they send it out? Is one of the things that we probably want to take a look at. Webmail, same thing. File transfers, what type of file transfers are being made? Also, you know that in instant messaging, you can, you can attach uh, files to instant messages, and you can send them out that way. I want to talk about Snowden just for another second. Now, Snowden wouldn't have been caught in any of these things, right? Because what he did was he downloaded files, I think 1.7 million files, something like that, onto USB, um, U a USB stick. So here, maybe it wouldn't have been caught through email transfer, but maybe somebody should have noticed why him, why he was um, downloading that much information at one time and why he had access to that information in the first place. So let's look at some of these other things. That goes to my next bullet point. Lacks improper or missing access controls to systems containing sensitive data. We have to use what we call least privilege, you know, need to know. Those type of things need to be in place to look for these type of things. You know, but I don't know what's missing. I don't know where it's missing until I have some kind of way of alerting me that this is what's happening, that I have, um, I have a problem somewhere. I have to recognize that I have a problem in the first place. But let's look at some of the ways that this, this happens. You probably heard this a lot. You see it all the time in the news. But how about loss of stolen computers, laptops, mobile devices with sensitive unencrypted information and data on it? Um, at my job, we were able to VPN, VPN into our system, so we feel like we're pretty, um, we're pretty safe. <clears throat> but what if somebody is able to tap into that by some means, and that information there is not encrypted and can be seen? You know, you've heard many times about the VA and other organizations losing laptop with data on it, um, those type of things. When I was in, um, when I was a special agent with the Air Force, I used to get calls all the time about people finding computers. When I get there, there's computers with airplanes, schematics, there's computers with social security numbers and all this information because it wasn't wiped clean before it was donate, donated. We had something called DRMO back then where you donate stuff to schools and libraries and I would get these calls and they're freaking out because of the information they find on there. Another um, way is insecure transmission of personal identifiable or other restricted data. Now, I, I hate talking about companies. I won't give a name, but there's another company I worked at where I was in charge of security awareness training. And on a daily basis, we had data leaks. And the reason was this. Um, they, they dealt with a lot of um, hospitals, a lot of doctor's offices, and things like that. Doctors are not sophisticated at cybersecurity. They were, still, they were still using fax machines to fax personal identifiable information. Um, here's what would happen. 
they will fax something to another doctor's office for a doctor that didn't exist there anymore. What I mean is that they may have moved from that location and now they had someone else there or it's a new phone number or what have you. And then I would get a call from, a, I remember one of them was an architect. And this architect had got like 400 pages of patient information with all their insurance information, their PII, what ails them and everything. And good, he was good enough to call the number that was on the fax cover page to let us know. But my point is, uh, most people, we think that most people understand these things. But doctors, lawyers, architects, engineers, the common folk don't understand cybersecurity and how they're supposed to protect this data without us teaching them how it's done. So this is one of the problems that we ran across. Abuse by authorized insiders of databases and other back-end systems. Um, I, I tell stories about how people feel that if they created something within an organization, that it belongs to them. No, it belongs to the org organization. People often leave and they take their intellectual property, what they think is their intellectual property, along with them, uh, and they feel no harm, no foul. I take it with me. I, I, I'm the one that invented it. And I'll take it with me and I'll use this so I can start off in my new company on a good, on a good note. That intellectual property belongs to your company, and you don't want it walking out the door. So those authorized insiders are taking these things from your databases. Okay. Another thing I kind of told you this with the computers that I, that I told you we used to get back, but insecure or, or improper destruction of information is another big problem that we have. Reuse of laptops and backup devices by second or third parties. They're not wiped well. They're not cleaned well. Most people don't know the proper ways for getting rid of information on these devices. You know, it depends on the type of information that you have and how sophisticated. Most people think you just erase something, you just hit the delete button, and it's gone. Well, we folks in the security field, we folks in the IT field just know that's not true. Information can still be had from those devices. Lack of separation of duties and access controls on databases and other shared systems. Again, least privileges and need to know. Also, we have something called a complete transaction. Two people... You know, depending on the transaction, the data, two people should not, if I go to a bank and I put money into a bank and the teller is able to make my deposit, he should not also be able to transfer money into another bank account. That should have to go to a manager. That's that separation of duties. He cannot complete that entire transaction alone, and therefore we, we help to try to prevent fraud unless there's some type of collusion involved there. So I have some general recommendations for you. Uh, before my partner talks about some of the things that he had, but I, I want to talk about how we can address some of these issues that we have. Because stopping that insider data linkage um, while still allowing legitimate use of and access to that company's digital assets are, is a big challenge. You know, how do we do it? What's the most common means and ways that we can work to try to, um, to, to, to steal the tie of our information going out of the door? One of the biggest things, I believe this is number one, whatever technology you buy, whatever type of um, process you put in place, the most important thing, I told you, is the human element. Therefore, employee training is going to be the most important. The potential rogue employee or the corporate spy is going to be a significant security concern. But I told you the majority of the insider data leaks are going to be caused by human error or just by carelessness, as my first bullet says. So we need to have a robust and continuous, as I told you in the beginning, continuous employee cyber training program. That might help employees become less susceptible, susceptible to social engineering and phishing and other means of making um, the insider uh, an unknowing, um, complicit partner um, something that we don't want them to be. Right? We need to have continuous touch points as far as trying to um, make sure, not just once a year, but that all the time they're thinking about security. Another thing that, that is really kind of new out there now, I really truly believe in, I wrote a book on this and I'm a big advocate of it, is user and entity behavior analytics. And I'm going to talk about that just for a second. But user and entity behavior analytics, what it can do for you, it can detect, um, detect subtle, it should be not subtitle, but subtle changes in employee behavior and activity. Okay. It's going to tell us if something is different. It's going to look for anomalies. It's going to detect things like when employee credentials are used by other people. Let me just talk about this just for a second. So as a human being, we have a natural uh, and phenomenal capacity to, to look at information, take in that information, establish some um, baselines, probably multiple baselines from different situations that we see, different actors that we see. We can compare in our mind that incoming information to those baselines, and we can determine an appropriate response 
when we see variations from that baseline um, beyond a given tolerance point that we are that we are you know, might be susceptible to. So what if we could develop a security system that could do that same type of thing? Now you all know we don't have artificial intelligence or anything like that yet, but what if we can teach a machine to pay attention to how each one of our user typically acts when they're on the system, how they behave, how they can communicate so that it could take notice if something or somebody was not quite right, you know, kind of like the movie Minority Report. They're going to do something and we know they're going to do it before they even do it. So what if we had the, the ability to do that? Now, if we pay close attention to their words, their sentence structure, um, how they develop them, what's, what's not said, this is something called psycholinguistics. And with that, we can gain insight into that person's private thoughts, his private life, what it is that he's thinking about doing. Now, there's also psycholinguistic software out there that provides us with some real-time tracking capability based on some of the things that we're able to watch, to see, to profile with those individuals. When I was law enforcement, we, you know, we had behavioral pro profiling to try to figure out where crimes are going to be committed so we can try to prevent it in the first place. That's like community policing. Put some police in the community, stop the crime. So the software we would use would be sophisticated enough to dif differentiate between what's expected from that employee, you know, especially if it's like occasional employee sarcasm and he really didn't mean it, and then from those patterns that may significantly be a genuine threat that's out there developing. So we have this psycholinguistics that we can put to use. And that's kind of the, the underlying aspects or underlying, this is what user behavior analytics is all about. Okay? It gives cybersecurity a broad range of tools to try to spot that anomalous behavior out there of those credential users, those people who should be inside your system. And that's kind of what I want to deploy here, what I want to talk about as I go on. So another general recommendation then is network monitoring, and hopefully network monitoring using user behavior analytics. So we're going to look at things like, is the employee concurrently logged into the IT system from a geographically separated location? You know, uh, Derek should be in the building today. I, I can work from home, but when I work from the, in the building, it shows that I'm in the building. When I work from home, it shows that I'm, I'm working from home. So maybe that should be recognized by someone and say, why is Derek in the building downloading something right now? It looks at his employee credentials used while the employee is on vacation. It will recognize and know that Derek is out of the office now. He's out on vacation, but someone is logging in using his um, credentials. Or even better yet, it might look at Derek works from 9 to 5, so why is he logging in at 3 o'clock in the morning? So what does it do? User Activity Monitor, is, it says, user-centric solution. It alerts people, it alerts us on suspicious trends for case-by-case -case analysis. We can look at that individual, and we can see what that individual is doing and how we, can, um, how we can work with that information to try to make security better for our organization. Again, it observes and records actions and activities. Derek works 9 to 5, not 3 in the morning on Saturday. And we could also go back and use this information when we're doing a detailed investigation after the fact. Something has occurred, we want to get to the root cause of it, of this incident. How do we go back and figure out what has happened? Well, user behavior analytics allows us the, um, the power to do that. The real power of user behavior analytics is the real-time detection of threat activity. Okay? Again, suppose somebody has gotten in, they're using those, those um, compromised credentials of yours. You know, they know exactly what they're looking for, exactly how to require it, exactly where it is. So in less than a few minutes, they can go in and get your sensitive information. They can get, uh, they can transfer it out with the FTP file or whatever. Uh, how long will it take to download a couple thousand customer names and credit card information? Not very long. Okay, not it doesn't take long at all. Uh, it's going to take. I tell you this, it's going to be faster than a human response can can than a human can respond. I used to do something called computer network defense, and we're watching 24 by 7 to see if we can catch that behavior. Before I can notice it, they could be gone. Okay? And the first evidence of that data theft is going to be large volumes of, of calls from my customers asking me, Derek, what the heck is going on? You know, my identity has been stolen. What have you all done? And then my, my forensic team is going to go in, and they're going to pour over my system logs, and they're going to try, to try to catch the crooks. But the damage to my organization's reputation, the damage to my customers' credit ratings, the damage to our income base is probably already going to be done. 
So we're going to use this user behavior analytics, entity behavior analytics, to try to monitor those individual users as I saw. I'm trying to stop the attackers in their tracks. Okay, I'm trying to get to them before damage can be done. Another way, thing here is preventing data linkage takes planning and forethought on our part. Okay? We have to look at not only our insiders, but the people we make insiders, um, like our, our outside contractors. Those are malicious insiders, often motivated by financial gain. We know that, espionage, professional revenge. Those outside contractors would not generally be subject to the same motivations as our insiders. They're looking for what's above, financial gain, um, espionage, professional revenge, or it could just be a problem like with the target, air conditioning problem. Person just have access to our system. You're able to get in. Now, think about this. Target has probably sophisticated, I know they have sophisticated security practices in place. But if they have an air conditioning company come in to do work for them, that air conditioning company probably don't have as sophisticated security measures in place as Target. I use them as my front door to get me in. And then I have the keys of the kingdom. I, I escalate my privileges. I can do whatever I want to do. So we have to watch our outside contractors as well. Going back to user and entity behavior analytics, it allows me to analyze which application access sensitive data. What are they doing? What are they accessing this data with? You know, um, what are they doing when, I, when they're in my system? I want to talk about something just for a second. According to the Committee on National Security uh, Systems Directive 504, it is the technical capability, I'm going to read this, the technical capability to observe and record the actions and activities of an individual at any time or any device accessing U.S. government information in order to detect insider threats and to support an uh, authorized investigation. So I want to look at things like keystroke monitoring. I want to look at screen captures. I want to look at file shadowing and specific user attributions. I want to look at um, collecting triggers that's identified through um, data analytics and data mining. Okay, all these type of things I want to look at, and the user behavior analytics is going to allow me to do that. Okay, I'm going to integrate that into my system, hopefully into my um, my my security um, information system, that, my monitoring system. Okay, now going back to this slide that you see before you, there's a guy. His name is Igor Bakalov from Secure Secure Runnings, they call it, and he says that user and entity behavior analytics is the most effective technology to deal with insider threat because it analyzes data from traditional protective controls like identity access management systems, your high privilege account monitoring, your data loss prevention systems. And it's going to take these um, security events like your VPN logins and your Windows events and your web proxies and your metadata from your HR um, and, and your enterprise inventories and all these things. And it's going to take it and it's going to look for meaningful deviations from your normal business activities. Okay? And it's going to detect those malicious activities on both the insiders and also your outsiders that have those hijacked credentials who's masquerading as those insiders. So your user behavior, um, your user and entity behavior analytics solutions is going to audit and analyze those files and those applications and the access to those of, of each individual in order to detect and connect those data points to try to see if there's any type of suspicious um, user behavior that's out there that's being indicated. Okay, so that's kind of what we're looking at there. At, connect those disparate data points, flag suspicious behavior. Um, look at um, um, suspicious application behavior, those type of things. My next uh, recommendation, and we're getting there, folks, is information segmentation. So companies implement separation of duties. We talked about that to try to mitigate financial fraud. Inside of data leakage can be mitigated by segmented data and network access. So people, even if they get the credentials, can't get to the good stuff. They can't get to your goods, right? Not without going in and have to request some special um, ac access or be authorized in or something like that. We want to control over our entire business cha um, chain and make sure that no one in there, not, not your system admin, no one is getting to your goods without having a reason for being there, and you can identify what that reason is. So... With the user behavior analytics, I want to establish that baseline of normal um, insider behavior and resources, uh, you know, accesses to my resources. And then I want to look for variations from the normal um, to help predict what those insider threats are if there is an insider threat. 
Yeah, I want to be alerted to those. I want to collect that data from files. I'm going to collect data from emails, your IT sources. I'm going to get a big picture of every individual in our organization so I can be able to generate alerts in near real time so I can try to stop it again, as I said, in its tracks. So what I want to do now is I want to turn it over to my partner, and I want him to tell you a little bit about what they have that can help do the types of things that I recommend and describe in my portion just a few moments ago. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate it. Let's see, you got to send me the uh, presenter role here. Hang on, maybe I can do that. I can. All right, I appreciate it, Derek. Hey, everyone, my name is Jack. I'm an engineer at Variato. I'm going to be talking briefly about two of our products, Variato Recon and Variato 360, that can assist you in detecting data leakage and determining exactly what happened. I'll also be showing you how they work together. Right now, we're looking at the configuration for a Windows recording policy in Variato 360 and Variato Recon. This policy configuration screen allows you to define how and what to record on a client computer that you're monitoring with either Variato 360 or Variato Recon. As you can see, you're able to monitor which websites users visit and how much time they spend using those websites. Email and chat and IM conversations can be monitored too, as well as files transferred to or from websites or FTP servers. And also document tracking events, which allows you to easily monitor information about new files that are created or existing files that are modified, deleted, renamed, or printed on local drives, network drives, locally synced cloud storage folders for Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, or Dropbox, as well as removable USB drives. Derek mentioned keystroke monitoring earlier. Keystrokes that your users type can be monitored, as well as screenshots that are taken of the user's computer at regular intervals or when specific defined events occur, which can add much needed context around any other activities that are taking place. Both Variato Recon and Variato 360 record the exact same information. The key differences between the two products, however, is what is done with the data that's captured. With Variato Recon, the data is going to be stored safely and privately on the client computer for the last 30 days, and nobody's able to see that data. Metadata that describes the activity is sent back to the server, and Variato Recon analyzes that data to determine what activities are normal for a user, and then begins to detect shifts in behavior that can alert you when those anomalies are detected. Variato Recon is also able to scan for and detect specified keywords and phrases whenever they're used. When a computer is being recorded with Variato 360, on the other hand, the data associated with the monitored activities is sent from the client to the server as quickly as possible, making that data ready for review and investigation in the Variato Management Console. It's important to note that each computer can be monitored with Variato Recon or Variato 360, or both if you'd like. Now that Variato Recon has been deployed and has had time to determine a level of activity that's normal for my users, I begin to receive alerts such as this one that indicates an unusually high level of document tracking activity for a user in my organization named Tara O'Sullivan. This alert in and of itself might not be enough for me to begin an investigation of Tara O'Sullivan's activities, or, I might, or it might be enough, or I might combine the receipt of this alert with the additional knowledge that Tara has decided to leave my organization and go work for a competitor. In any case, if you'd like to switch to investigative mode, as I call it, you simply apply a standard or a floating Variato 360 license to Terra's computer, and within just a few minutes, you will have the details of all of Terra's activities for the last 30 days. Once I've unlocked the Variato Recon data on Terra's computer, it's made available for review in the Variato Management Console. There are several different ways that you can review data in Variato's management console, but we're going to look right now at the 360 dashboard section. Here you have a series of pre-built folders that contain various charts depicting your users' activities.
I've custom built this folder and its charts specifically for my investigation of Tara and her colleague Frank. The chart on the upper left, for example, shows these users' document tracking events and breaks them down by the type of device. The green bar here, this green bar represents Tara's activities that are associated with the removable USB drive. These charts are interactive, so if I want to, I can click the green segment on the bar and a data explorer will open, which allows me to see the details associated with those activities. As I look through these activities on the removable drive, I can see the date and time of the event, which computer it occurred on, the activity, and the drive, path, and name of the file in question. If I would like any additional context around these activities, I can click on the View Screen Snapshots button in the far right column, and that will show me the screenshot that was taken on Tara's computer nearest to the time that that event was recorded. Once the snapshot viewer opens, I'm able to use DVR-like controls to move forward and backward, seeing everything that was taking place on Tara's computer before and after the event in question occurred. Let's watch through here just a little bit. You can see Tara copying those files. As I watch Tara copy the files to her removable drive, I notice a troubling Skype conversation that's taking place with Frank. Very Auto 360's recorded the entire Skype conversation, however, making it very easy for me to quickly review its contents and determine whether or not there was any collusion or other inappropriate activity. In this case, there was, and the Skype conversation helped me to understand why Tara copied these files to the removable storage. If the investigation results and you're needing to turn over any of the recorded information to a third party, such as your organization's human resources department or legal counsel, you do have the ability to easily export this data into formats that can be viewed outside of the Very Auto Management Console. I appreciate your taking the time to allow me to quickly demonstrate only a small bit of Very Auto Recons and Very Auto 360's functionality. If you would like to see more, please let us know. We'd be happy to spend some time with you uh, for a personalized one-on-one -on -one demo. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Nick for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Looks like we've got a, a couple of questions here. Um, uh, I'm not going to be showing my screen. It's all right here. So uh, AB wants to, to watch, asks here, uh, who watches the watcher? Who can, uh, who can UBA the security teams? How can we know the watcher didn't become socially engineered? How do we make sure the security expert will admit getting hacked with his reputation and job at stake? He's basically, he's giving a couple of examples, but the question is, who's watching the watcher and how can that be used? Anybody, are, you, wants to you, take, are you gonna take it, Derek? You want me to take that question? Well, why don't you start first and I'll, I'll jump on. Sure. Uh, with specific, how it specifically relates to Very Auto 360 and Very Auto Recon, we have a whole lot of customers who deploy uh, this software not only to their end users, but they include their administrative and security teams amongst those end users. So the product is able to observe their activities and look for anomalous behaviors uh, there as well. And so from a non-product um, standpoint, this is Derek, and I'll, I'll say this. Um, somewhere we're gonna have to trust someone. You know, we, we, we hire it starts when, when you hire a person and we go through background checks and we do all these things that first of all try to hire the best people and the most trustworthy people. We have to give someone that trust. So in our security department, our security folks, of course, we have to trust that they're gonna they have the best interests of our organization in mind and they're gonna try to find these type of anomalies. Um, they're gonna try to protect our organization. So yes, that's a question. Um, who's watching the watchers? But we, we hope that the watchers are doing the right thing ethically and morally and legally. And that's the best we're going to be able to do. But also, you know, there are reports, there are logs, there are audits. That's why we have in, in the government, we have the inspector general. And they go out and they do investigation, they do audits and they ask for information. Someone in your organization would take on that role. They're going to look at the information, they're going to look at the audits, they're going to look at the logs. It's not just one person. You have several people doing this activity and hopefully you can capture, um, capture this behavior. That's my take on it. Great, great answer here. So um, uh, there's a question here from Rokas. I think probably this is for you, Jack. How can we set email alerts about files transferring? Sure. Um, I could show you if you want to share. Uh, let's see. I can make myself presenter again, I think. Here. Wrong button. Let's do this. 
So any alerts that you generate or any activities that are monitored with Veriato 360, you can create alerts for. Uh, we have a section here for uh, regular event alerts, where if you want to set up an alert simply to uh, get an email notification um, when a particular, uh, or I'm sorry, a file is transferred, uh, you can do that. Or what you can do is you can set up alerts to look for anomalous behaviors. So Veriato Recon will uh, keep track of the number of files that a user transfers from day to day, and it will determine that this user will just say normally transfers across FTT or uh, attaches through email or transfers to Dropbox 10 files a day, we'll say. Uh, it'll determine that that's what's normal for that user. So then all of a sudden one day when that user uh, transfers 35 files, that would be unusual and very out of recon could alert to that. Uh, and as we saw in the example alert I showed earlier, uh, you may not have noticed it on there, you may have, but it will tell you that what the normal level for the user is so you can kind of gauge how far off they are. So it might say Steve normally transfers 15 files a day and today Steve transferred 32 files. So uh, you can set up alerts either to look for specific levels of activity or you can set up recon to uh, look for anomalous based on what's normal for that user. And 32 for Steve we said is unusual but uh, for Derek 32 might be normal so it's able to do that on a user by user basis what's normal for one user. Uh, may not necessarily be normal for another. All right, Thanks for the we, have time, we have time for one more question here. Uh, Matt wants to know, I'm curious how organizations can monitor activity in the cloud where surveillance software cannot be deployed. So if, if the users are accessing a computer in the cloud somewhere where uh, an agent or what we call a recorder can't be deployed, you can still uh, monitor that to some degree by putting a recorder on their client computer that they're, that they're accessing that computer in the cloud from. And uh, at a minimum, you would still be able to see keystrokes that are sent to the computer in the cloud. And you'd, of course, be able to see what was on the screen uh, with screenshots and look for keyword alerts and things like that, too. I just want to add something to that real quick. So to figure out on that, it doesn't matter if that user is working with personal storage devices or they're working on the cloud. It's the behavior of that person that's being analyzed, not the system upon which that person is working. So once that person is inside the perimeter defenses, we're going to be able to detect and prevent hopefully that malicious activity. Great answers, guys. It looks like actually we're kind of at the end of the questions anyways. We're two minutes past the hour, so just to respect the audience's time, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and call it a day for the moment. So um, Jack, Derek, hey, you guys, thank you very much for a great presentation. Derek, thank you for all the in uh, information that you provided to the audience as well. So uh, glad you guys got an opportunity to actually uh, educate the audience here at large. So thank you both very much. My pleasure. See you all next time. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, Derek, your good. stories are always great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, those in the audience, hopefully you got something out of today's webcast. Thank you for your attendance today. Thank you for your questions as well. And uh, we will see you on the next webcast. This concludes today's webcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you.